we are not even scratching the surface of all that God is going to be, that, that he is going to do among us and in our city. And it's just going to be incredible that we get to be a part of that at the ground floor. It would be incredible to be part of the ground floor workings of Apple when they first started as a company and work with Steve Jobs in his garage and, and see it grow from there. But we, we're doing something even bigger than that. And, and when this church is as big as God makes it and has promised to make it, we're going to be able to look back and say, I remember when. And I, I remember then. And I, I, and I remember how God did this. And do you remember when God did that? And how he just multiplied this. And then he moved us to that. And then he took this. And it's just going to be amazing. And so I'm excited about that. So uh, I, I will be bringing that to you over the next course of the rest of the year. Amen. Luke 13, 6 through 9. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking, seeking fruit on the fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dug about it, dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. I want to talk to you about growth. Growth personally, growth as a church. I want to talk to you about a subject that is very common to people in the business world. Common to us. It's a thing that I work around every day. And in one way or another, you work around it every day. It's called a return on the investment. There is a return desired on the investment. And so that's what I've titled my message tonight is a return on the investment. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this word and we thank you for this time together. We pray, O oh God, that you would speak your word to us tonight. Speak to our hearts and our minds. Let us hear, God, what you would have to say to us tonight. God, we worship you and praise you and thank you. Touch us in this house tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. To sorrow has a standard for the way that it invests its money. Our company is in the profit or is in the business of making a profit. We're not a community service. We do not provide gasoline to the community as a service to the community. There's a desire when they boil that dinosaur to be able to make some profit out of that thing. Our corporate managers were hired to watch over every aspect of the business of Tesoro. Every department within Tesoro has a manager that is over it and must report on the activities of their department. I have a budget. I have to watch my budget. I have to spend my money according to how the money in that budget was allotted. Every line item in my budget is approved. I do not and I cannot just carte blanche say, I got a credit card and I'm going to buy these things. They are all approved. Every project has to be scrutinized. Every department will at some time have something that they desire to have. It's, it's beyond the, the, just the basic business. I, I want to make an addition to my uh, training department. I want to buy more this or that. I, I, want to, I want to do this or I want to do that. These are projects. Now, to sorrow, if they manage their business properly, at the end of the year is going to have this pile of money. They should have a pile of money left over from all of the business that they've been doing. From that pile of money comes the money to do all of these projects. So, 
if Rachel works it to sorrow and Scott works it to sorrow and Heather works it to sorrow and Sister Mary Irene works it to sorrow and you all have your projects. Each one of you have this and that that you want to do for your department. I have the pile of money. Each person has to present to management. This is why I think that this should be built and this is why I think this is why you should give me a portion of that pile of money. Now, all four of you are not going to get it. Maybe only two. And so there has to be a standard whereby we measure who gets what. Who's going to get the money. And so it may be extremely important to you, Sister Mary Irene. It may, it may be critical to your department, Scott. It may be something that you absolutely cannot do without, Rachel. And Sister Heather, it might be the one thing that will turn your whole department around. And all four of you are looking for that little bit. And you're going to come to me, and you're going to present it, and I'm going to pull out my measuring stick. And here's how I'm going to measure it. I'm going to ask you, Sister Mary Irene, what is the return on the investment? I'm going to give you from this pile of money. Whoever. But when I give it to you, it's not meant for you to just take. You see, what I'm giving you is a loan. You're taking a loan from the company. And you're saying to the company, I can pay that back. I can give you a return on that investment. Tesoro's standard is that whatever we do in a project, it has to have a return on the investment within three years. You want $5 million? Fine. You show to me that you can repay me back $5 million in five years. That the project that you want to spend this money on can be repaid back within five years, within three years. That's, that's the measuring stick that Tesoro uses. Every project, every one of them is governed by that measuring stick. They have to see a return on investment. If I put money into this project, when will I get my money back? I must get my money back and there must be a continual measurement of profit that comes out of the project that I give you. If I'm going to invest in it, I want to make sure that I'm going to get my money back and that I can expect that I would get a constant flow of money from that. Now, Sister Heather, you may have a four-year ROI, return on investment, but your long-term cash improvement may be greater than Sister Mary Irene's. She may be able to give me two years return on investment back, but the cash flow from that won't, won't be as big as yours. So there are other, other factors there, but there is always the look at return on investment. How are you going to return the investment that I give? How are you going to return to me the money that I am going to give to you? Every industry works like this one way or another. Every industry has to have a measuring stick on its return on investment. Every industry compares the money that is going out to how much effort and, and, and work that I'm going to have to do for what I'm going to get back from it. The return on investment. The fishing industry has a return on investment. If, if, I, if I go out, it's going to cost me X amount of dollars to fuel my boat. I, I'm talking commercial fishing. They, they got to fuel the boat. They got to pay the crew. They got to they gotta buy the gear. They got to get all this. They're going to look at what is, what is the price of salmon right now? What is it expected to be? What does the run size look like? And will I be able to go out and can I expect 
at the prices that I am looking at with the expected run that is expected to come? Am I looking at something that would be worth my time to go do? Or do I just scrap fishing this year and I just go work as a contractor somewhere else because it would be a lot of work. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm risking a breakdown. I'm risking an injury with one of the crewmates. I'm risking the fact that those fish aren't going to be there. If it's marginal, I'm going to look at it and say, is it worth my time or should I do something else? That, that's the fishing industry. They're, they're going to look at it like that. They're going to see whether or not that ROI is going to be possible for them. Churches desire a return on investment. You got missionaries that are out there. If the missionary is just going to be living in America and he's once in a while going to go out on the field, are we going to want to support that missionary? No. Why? Because if we're going to invest, we want that person out there doing it. I'm, I'm just being honest. That's, that's what we want. So if you're going to invest in it, you, you want it to happen. Ladies, you desire return on investment. You, you go home and, and you look at a recipe and you're looking at that recipe and you're thinking, well, this looks really good. But you'll look at that recipe and I've got about 10 different steps in this recipe that I have to do. And this is going to take me two and a half hours to make. Now I have to invest my time and my energy and all these ingredients. I'm going to have to go to the store to get half of these things. Will you do it? Are you going to make that? Probably not. It looks like fried bologna sandwiches again. <laughs> Why? Because you're looking at a return on investment. How, how hard is this going to be for me to make? How good does it look like? It? Now, if it looks like it's just amazing, you're going, to, you're going to put the effort into it. If after you get it and you taste it and it's not amazing... Are you going to make it again? I mean, it's good. All of it got eaten. Why? Like, you're looking at a return on investment. I did all this for that. That's what it boils down to. I, I did all of this for that. You know, there's, there's stretches of the river, Scott, that I won't fish. I just don't fish it. I just never have caught a fish there. When I'm going at Bings and I put in at Bings and I go up river and I'm going to go trout fishing, man, I have, I have drugged that river all the, way, all the way down to Bings. And I've done it several times. And I know where I catch fish and I know where I don't catch fish. In the places that I don't catch fish, reel them up. I'm not dragging through here. I, I'm not fishing this area. I, I've just not caught fish in this area. Now, there's probably monsters in there. But the return on my investment is not worth it. I, I'm not going to do that. Nature is designed for a return on investment. Genesis 1, 11 and 12. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, and fruit trees yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was after itself, after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, <laughs> there's absolutely no possibility of evolution here. Because everything brings seed after its kind. If you are an apple, you're going to bring forth an apple. If you are an orange, you're going to bring forth an orange. The apple does not morph into something else. The orange does not morph into something else. The, it doesn't work that way. It just does not work that way. It reproduces exactly what it was. And so nature it's, uh, ensures it, repro it, it reproduces only healthy things. Okay? 
So the seed and all that stuff is in itself. But nature makes sure that only healthy things survive. The weak are preyed upon. The lions are going to eat the slow zebras. The hyenas are going to weed out the weak and the, the slow. They're going to take down the sickly. If you reproduce gazelles that are just really slow, guess what the cheetahs are going to do? They're going to eat all the gazelles. Why? Nature makes sure that the slow and the weak just don't make it. They don't make it. it nature ensures that all of its resources go to making sure it's producing a good return on its investment. The grasslands, not meant for the slow gazelles. Nope. Send me out slow gazelles. Well, the cheetahs will just weed them out. All of that fertile ground is going to be eaten by the, by the strong and the fast. Nature makes sure of that. Go down to the watering hole, and the slow zebras are not going to be down there. They may come to the watering hole, but they don't usually come out. All of that water, that precious water, is going to make sure that the return on its investment is going to be to give to the strong and to the fast. That's just the way it is. That's, that's, how, nature's, that's how nature makes sure it, it puts its, um, its process to, to, uh, to use. Now, God desires a return on investment as well. He placed the process of the return on investment in nature. He gave us the food chain, the seed and the plant itself reproducing after its kind. If, if, if apples don't have, if an apple tree doesn't really reproduce many apples, guess what? The apple tree that does produce a lot of apples is going to overtake the ground. It will do it. Because all those nutrients from the ground are needed. And that apple tree that doesn't produce is eventually just going to die. Because all the nutrients are going to be taken by those that are constantly producing. Nature is a tool to teach us. What we see in nature is meant for us to learn from these things. They are God's method of teaching us His principles. So that we can understand what God desires. Now Jesus spoke continually of the method of, in methods of teaching this principle of uh, reproduction and its relationship to a return on investment. Jesus talked to us continually about this in the scriptures. So he used the parable of, of the things that were in nature to teach us that. Jesus didn't take abstract things, but he, he taught us things that we could understand in ways that we could understand it. And so he said in Matthew 12, 33 through 34, he said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruits. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Return on investment is, is what, you, what you put into it, you're going to get out of it. What, what you put into it, you're going to get that out of it. You, you will know a tree by its fruit. It will return exactly what it is. It, it can't take an a, 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 a apple tree and get oranges off. It's going to be exactly what it is. You planted exactly what it was. Jesus used a lot of other parables. He, he, he taught the parable of the servants that were given the talents. And, and to one he gave five, to one he gave two, and to one he gave one. In that parable that he taught. And he said, he, he, he went away and then he came back and he called all of these servants in and he asked them to give an account of, of the work that they had done with the coins that they were given. And the first one came in, and we know the parable well. They, the, the first one came in that had five, and he said, Look, Master, here's five that you gave me, and five more. Yes. And the next one came in and said, Look, Master, here's two that you gave me, and, and here's two more. Right. And the last one came in and said, Master, I know you're a hard guy to work for. 
and that you're you're very very stern fisted and 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 he you're just a really hard guy to get along with so I took the one that you gave me and I made sure that when you got back I still had that one and here it is I'm returning it back to you now the master had a a reaction to each and every one of them and we know the story to to two of them the one with five and the one with two, he told them, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you Lord over many. So he looked at the one that didn't have a, a, anything to give to him other than exactly what he gave him. And he said, you are a slothful and a wicked servant. You knew that I was a a very hard man to work for. You knew that I was going to demand of you. And yet you dug in the ground and hid this thing. Now there's a lot of things you can preach from that. But the overall overarching message that Jesus is bringing here. Is that two brought a return on an investment and one did not. The two that brought a return on the investment. The Lord praised them. The one that did not. The Lord condemned. And so we see that, that there's a desire, a hunger, a, 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 an expectation of a return on investment. Jesus came across a fig tree that had no figs. And we know the story of how he cursed it. Why? Because he had an expectation to receive from the tree a fig. He said in verse 19 of the, of the scripture, that we read, every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, now Paul was speaking to the Gentiles and he said this about return on investment. Romans 11, 19 through 22. Thou will say then that the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest also he spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell. Severity, but towards thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou shalt be cut off. He said, they were profitable. They weren't doing what I wanted them to do. They did not continue in my faith. So I cut them off. I grafted you in. But be careful of your own life and in what you're doing. Because if for whatever reason you walk in unbelief as well, you'll be cut off as well. Why? He's saying, I expect that that all of the nutrients that's flowing through this vine and all of the stuff that's coming through it, that is coming to you Gentiles... The, the influx of, of, of the power of God, the move of the Holy Ghost, you've got to work in it and live in it. Elsewise, you're just like them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're just like them, there's no return on the investment. Yeah. That's what, that's what G, uh, Paul is telling the church in, in Rome. Um, our opening scripture in Luke chapter 13, 6 through 9. He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And he said unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. I had an expectation that it do something with what it's planted in. He said, cut it down. Where was I at? Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after this thou shalt cut it down. It's, he said, why cumbereth it the ground? Why should it continue to soak up nutrients? And can you just soak up all this stuff and all the work that I'm asking you to do? It needs to just be cut down and then you can plant a different tree and it can grow. Yes. 
So uh, without, without argument, the focus is about making sure that there is a return on the investment. These scriptures are clearly evident in the necessity of growth. In the necessity of returning on the investment. So what is the return that God wants? I want to return an investment to God. I do. I know you all do. What is the return on the investment that God seeks out of you and out of me? What is it that God wants us in our life to return on that investment. And can I say this first and foremost? That God is not a hard taskmaster. He would never ask of you, Crystal, to return an investment that is beyond your ability to give. Nope. God will never ask anything of you and I. He, he's not the kind of God that says, I want you to return an investment. Now I'm going to I'm going to put in you this, but I'm going to expect this. And let's just see if you can even come close to it. God's not like that. God is not like that. But what is it that God wants us to return? We have to understand that there are two aspects to the issue of return on investment. There is the growth of the plant itself to producing fruit it the plant itself needs to grow so that it can produce fruit okay so there is that aspect the plant has to grow it needs to grow so that it, can, it needs big long strong trunk and 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 roots and, and and branches so that it can support bearing fruit and then the second is there has to be a process of reproduction that that not only must it grow but it must also reproduce it it must bear fruit it must reproduce for you and i there has to be the growth we have to grow ephesians 4 11 through 14 and i don't know if you've ever looked at this verse this way but i want you to look at this verse a different way and he gave. What does that mean? And he gave. He invested. Okay? Stop and think about it for just a second. He gave. He invested. He put in. He invested this. Some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. He invested that. He gave that. He put that out there. I'm going, to, I'm going to put this out there. I'm going to invest this. But the next word is what? Verse 12, first word. First word. Four. There's a reason. I've invested this. I've placed that out there. I've given you some, some evangelists, some prophets, some apostles, some teachers, some pastors. I've put them out there for... The perfecting of the saints for the working of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. I have put them out there for this purpose. The purpose is that the body would grow for the perfecting of the saints. He begins this passage with what God gave and he gave all sorts of ministries to the church, and that is what God invested. Now let's go on. Till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning of craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The purpose of the ministry is stated in the latter portion of the verses so that we can become perfect saints. So that we can become perfect saints. That we are strong in the doctrine and not tossed around with every doctrine that comes our way. God said, I've invested in the church. I've invested in the people these gifts of ministry so that the people that are in the church might grow. 
So that they will be strong in the doctrine. So that they will become mature. They will, get, they, they will become able to understand my word. Able to understand who I am and my purpose for their life. So that they can become strong. And that they will be able to withstand every false doctrine that comes their way. God is, is very, very particular and, and very set on the fact that He wants you personally to grow and to mature as a Christian. He does not want you sitting in a pew and being the same year after year after year after year. God desires that there be growth marks in your life. That you can look back and you can say, man, just a couple years ago, I struggled with these things. Man, just a couple years ago this was going on in my life but look where God has brought me and look how he has strengthened me I, I it, God is very particular about you and I growing it doesn't matter if you've been in the church your whole life it doesn't matter if you grew up in this from the time that you were born God desires that we grow up into the perfect man now I know for myself, and I don't believe that I'm misinterpreting the scripture, but none of us are perfect. No, no. And we'll probably die not being perfect. I know that for me. I always will have faults and failures and things that I struggle with. If, if, if Jesus had it with his apostles, trust me, I'm not of that stature. But I do know this, that as long as I continue to grow and work towards that perfect man right. and try to become who God wants me to be like, He's pleased with me. That's right. That's right. He's pleased with me. But the second part of that is, He doesn't want me listening to, right. hearing, debating with, mm -hmm. trying to understand or partake of false doctrine he don't want me blown around with every wind of doc that's why he gave us he invested the ministry in the church because the return on that investment the return on that investment that God wants from you is I want you to grow and I want you to be firm in the gospel absolutely mind made up heart made up spirit made up this is the gospel message and this is the gospel truth and so he brings to us evangelists and and we've had evangelists in this church man we've had some amazing evangelists in this church we're going to have more amazing evangelists in this church but let me tell you something I don't just let anybody come through here and we don't just get anybody coming through here but 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 I'm very particular about who we're going to bring up and what what we're who's going to preach in this church why because I know who you are and I know what you need and so I want you to be fed those things. Why? Because if there's going to be an investment in, 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 in a, an evangelist, there's a return on that investment that I'm wanting out of the church. I want out of the church it, to grow. I want you to be stronger in the doctrine. And so he brings us prophets. Man, when Brother Eli Hernandez comes up, we, we transcribe those messages. We get those messages out to you. You can read those messages. You can go back online, listen to them again. Man, why? Because that's the return on the investment. Do you understand that God gave you a pastor? Yes. And the purpose of the pastor that, that he puts through me the word and the direction for you so that you can grow into a perfect man and be strong in the gospel that's that's his investment in you do, do you see the love of God for you do you see how much he cares about you that he would invest these things in you and he would make all of these giftings we've had teachers that have come in we've we've had all kinds of people I know down in Florida you guys have got to have all kinds of stuff to, uh, of ministries that come through your church that your pastor allows in the church why because there is an investment that God is placing in the church that will grow the church. 
And so, Sister Heather, somebody might come in here, and they'll preach, and man, it just blesses you so much. Yeah. Whereas somebody else will say, well, that was good, but I didn't get much out of that. Why? Different ministries, different people, but God's investing in the church. Yes. He's investing in you. God is investing in you. The return He wants is you to grow. That's what He wants out of you. He wants you to grow in these ministries that are coming to you. He wants you to grow. Why? Because He's going to develop ministries in you. He's going to use you to minister. And He wants you strong in the doctrine. I don't know if you've ever seen that, that scripture that way. But that is an investment of God that he seeks a return on that investment. That's what God wants. He desires also that you have discipline. That you not be tossed around with everything that comes against you. That you stand strong no matter what. Next is that he desires there be a reproduction. Since we have been established and become strong, he demands reproduction out of us. He wants for you and I to reach the lost. God has placed the church in the world for a purpose. Now, I could go get another scripture and I can prove this to you, but I have read you scripture after scripture that God's great desire is for souls. I, I, can, I can quote to you scripture after scripture. That he was not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That, uh, uh, that was the heartbeat of the coming of Christ, to redeem mankind back to himself. Now, Jesus could have stayed here. He could have. He could have been crucified. He, he, he could have gone to the grave. He could have resurrected and then gone into Jerusalem and set up his throne in Jerusalem. He could have done that. And that's what the apostles expected to happen. They asked him at his ascension, will you at this time now set up your kingdom? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. But what did he tell them? But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Oh, my. What did he say? I'm not setting that kingdom up. That's not my plan. I, I did all of this. I could have stayed here. I could have told him, you better repent. You better be baptized in my name. And I'll fill you with my presence. He could have did that, but he didn't do that. What he did is he left those 12 apostles, or 11, and they brought in one more as an apostle. But he had many disciples, at least 120. And he filled them all with his spirit. And he said, now you go and you tell them. So what did Jesus do? He invested three and a half years in these men. Three and a half years into these women. Three and a half years into at least this 120. He invested that time in them. And then he invested his spirit in them. And then he said, I want to return on that investment. I want you to reach the world for me. So the second part of that is soul winning. The return on the investment. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to give you a, a evangelists and pastors and prophets and, and, and apostles and teachers. I'm, I'm going to give them all to you so that you can grow up and be strong. So that you can be strong in the word. I'm going to invest that in you. But I'm also investing in you the supernatural. I'm going to invest my spirit in you. I'm going to fill you with the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to give you my name. I'm investing that in you. I'm investing in you my authority. Why? So that you can bind principalities and powers for what purpose? To reach the lost. That's why. To reach the lost. Why? Because we were lost. It's not just for us. It's for them. So the return on the investment. Why would he fill you with the Spirit? Why would, you give, why would he give you his name? Why would he say, I've given you my authority over all of the kingdoms of the earth, and nothing by any means shall hurt you? Why did he say, I've put Satan under your feet? You see, all that he's invested in the church, 
He expects a return on that investment. That return on that investment is souls. Is souls. Can we stand tonight?